Welcome on this Wednesday afternoon here in Chicago, Illinois, or whatever time of day it is where you are joining us. We welcome you to our um, second in the series of our Road to Resilience learning series. Today's topic is train, plane, or automobile. How are you going to travel on that road to resilience? And we're going to look specifically at leadership and governance required to begin the journey. My name is Linda Nelson. I am the founder and president of i -Corps. I do manage the day-to-day -day operations of our education and credentialing programs, and I have specifically of late been very involved in um, the updating and writing of several standards, including three separate meetings this week at very early times in the mornings and some later in the day. But this is a key piece and a key part of the work that we do with i -Corps, um, with leading with the different areas of resilience in a global manner. One of the things that we're very excited about this year, and it actually came about as a suggestion of one of our regular webinar attendees to have some kind of a badge that was earned. And so because this year our um, webinars are all around a particular te uh, theme that build on each other, we have created um, the Road to Resilience badge and you can earn that by attending each of our webinars. Um, they are available on demand as well. So today's topic is how are we going to travel down that road to resilience? Um, during this year, we're also going to talk about things like where do we actually want to go on this journey and who's doing the planning for it? Who's going to be on that journey along with the person planning it? Um, we're always looking at roles and responsibilities. Who's in charge of the map? Who's in charge of the packing? Um, what are we going to do on that road or that journey if the road is actually closed? Um, what, if, what if some of the people on that journey get motion sickness? Or, you know, thinking about what else can disrupt our journey. Taking time to figure out what we've learned so far. Figuring out, uh, have we met? Are we where we're supposed to be? You know. Um, are we there yet? And or if not, how are we doing on that journey again? And then when we when we think that we've arrived, you know, are we in the right place? Is this where we actually want it to be? So those are some of the questions that we're going to be answered in this year's Road to Resilience journey. For today's agenda, we're going to look at the commitment needed for resilience to actually to actually take that trip. So we'll start out by talking at the policy. Then we'll look at governance and accountability as necessary for writing your strategy or your strategic plan. We'll look at our strategic objectives and, and really where should we focus that strategy. And lastly, we'll look briefly at some of the measurement criteria. We'll be looking much more in detail at that um, later in the year, but just looking at, you know, we need to have some measurement criteria in place when we start the journey so that we have an idea of how we're doing. Just like any of our other webinars, um, this will be available on our webpage in, about, in a couple of days. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. Um, feel free to use the questions button. I will be monitoring that today. And if I don't get to your questions um, during the webinar, I certainly will at the conclusion. And if there's anything we don't get to, um, we will include that, the question and the answer um, in when we send you your certificates. However, to, to achieve your to receive a certificate of attendance for today's um, webinar, you do need to attend a minimum of 35 minutes. If you are, have to leave and come back, just send us an email saying that you watched the recording. So the question on the table is, how are you going to travel down this road to resilience? So the first question is, are you going to travel by plane? And I like to think of a plane as being the fastest route on that journey. It's the most direct route, and it's pretty much you, unless you know, unless you live in a smaller town or a regional where you have to go to a regional airport, you can pretty much travel from point A to point B without any interruptions. Or are you going to take the train route, where you maybe it's going to take you a little bit longer? You might have some stops along the way, but everybody on your team is on that same train, um, whether you're in different cars of that train or not but there's probably going to be some stops along the way and certainly won't train, traveling by train, even some of those crazy bullet trains are not as fast as flying by an airplane. Or is your, 
is your organization really part of um, a little hesitant to get started or not sure where to go and you're going to be traveling by automobile and that automobile you may have a lot of stops on the way you may be regrouping along the way but you're deciding to, to kind of take the slowly but surely approach or alternately you can consider that you're going to do all three of these methods on your journey depending on um, which strategic objective that you're trying to meet so this is just kind of a silly metaphor for how to think about your journey but it is important for you to think about you know what speed do you need how quickly do you need to action on things and at what what things need to be prioritized so moving right into that we need to have a commitment to investing in resilience it is not going to happen on its own um, there are things that happen in organizations that you know they just kind of you, they're part of it embedded in your processes and they roll right along but this commitment to investing in resilience needs to be very intentional it needs to be monitored and there needs to be clear leadership so when you're looking at you know how should that investment in resilience be done what we see a lot of mostly <laughs> is this short-term view and the short-term view looks at the fact that this is going to cost too much we're not going to see gains right away so let's just look at it again later and i and i if i was in front of you in a room i could see a lot of hands going up and probably some frustrated hands that this is the view that's taken by your organization however resilience is a journey and it, you need to have a long-term view and essentially your investment in resilience is building that foundation for future growth it's not necessarily going it's probably not going to be something that you're going to see immediately unless you have some really quick wins that you can leverage one of the things and we're going to be referencing um actually it's pretty interesting i found this paper that was just published a couple of weeks ago by mckinsey called building a resilient tomorrow and i think that it um really identifies this idea that it is tomorrow and we have to be planning for tomorrow and one of the things that they found is that you know organizations that plan ahead and make investments in the future are outperform in competitors um, during regular times as well as during crisis times but we do know that when you have a short-term view it results in efforts that are often conducted in isolation. This is the biggest issue is that siloed way of working and that those efforts are really directly related to um, planning or responding or recovering to some sort of specific event or incident or crisis. I really like this graphic. Um, we've modified it, one that was originally created by Deloitte but looking at this context, <coughs> excuse me. So when you're planning your resilient strategy, you need to have an idea of what, where you're going to focus your efforts. And I'll say you need to focus your efforts on each one of these, but probably not at the same time. So are you gonna be looking kind of at your ecosystem view? And this might be either where you start or where you decide to end. It could, depending on um, what your strategic plan is, do you wanna take like a whole systems approach and look at your organization internally and externally and really look at having that customer-driven focused mission? And I will say that everything that we're talking about with resilience um, should be customer-focused, purpose-driven, customer-focused on all aspects, but in this case, you're looking um, a lot of times externally to your organization or to all, all aspects of things that might impact you. You should be, of course, be looking at your entire organization as a whole and how you do your work and try to, and try to move away from the hierarchical approach. And I'll say the deep hierarchical approach because we're, the, all of the data says that organizations who work in as flat a manner as possible um, and is it integrated or unsiloed way as possible, um, really do the best work and, and, and you see the most efforts coming back. And looking at this idea that the organization itself is a network of multidisciplinary areas that need to be working together. You might be focusing on, let's improve the resilience of our teams. 
So we want to look at how can we get our teams to be more high performing and make sure that they're really working in a connected manner. This is something that a lot of organizations have seen that has broken as we've become more decentralized and not necessarily decentralized, but decentralized ways of working and that we're not all working in the same places at the same time, which has sometimes broken um, some of the ways that teams have been able to work effectively. We all need leaders. So are we gonna focus our our resilience strategy initially on leadership and making sure that they're all on the same page and that they're working as kind of in a, an inclusive manner as possible versus kind of um, more, I'll say, micromanaging and telling people what to do. Um, and also looking at how to be, how to really get the full potential from the diverse work skill sets and diverse workforce that you have. Another focus can be how that work is executed. So looking at how do we build more resilient people and that we're gonna start there. It's really the opposite end of the pendulum from looking at your ecosystem. There's no correct way of doing this. It's really up to your organization is, do we wanna start with looking at the entire big picture or do we wanna start with really improving our talent and looking at our talent programs and making sure that our people are enabled to grow and develop and want to learn. So it's kind of like, are you gonna take that top-down approach or the bottom-up approach? And the bottom-up approach, not meaning that it's led by the individuals, but the fact that you're focusing on your individuals. And that, that also has me a bit intrigued as well um, as how this could be successful. The other piece that we really need to look at is there's kind of three buckets or three elements of enhancing resilience. i has our organizational resilience model that looks very similar to this. This is a graphic that um, I designed and a modified version of that will be in the new standard on organizational resilience um, policy and strategy that'll probably be published this fall. And they've, they've changed this um, graphic a little bit, but I really like the way we originally developed it, so I've kept that version of it. But the fact is you need to have a policy. And policy really helps you to ensure that your organizational behavior is aligned and everybody's working with that shared vision and purpose. That there's an understanding of your context of your organization, where your resilience efforts are going to be and how you influence those, and making sure that you have a culture that's supporting organizational resilience. And that goes, that those three things together um, are become directed by your policy. You also need to have a governance structure in place. And your governance structure needs to be diverse, not in, in your skills, in your leadership styles, and in the knowledge and experience that your leaders bring to the table. So you need to make sure that your leaders are effective and empowered to do their work, that they communicate effectively by sharing information and knowledge, and that they're focusing on continual improvement. And then really thirdly, on the operational side, um, we need to make sure that the organization itself is effectively managing risk and adapting to change. I'm sure if you've heard me speak before, I talk about not, when you don't manage change effectively, you're essentially introducing new risk. So you need to make sure that you have resources that are not just available, but that are adequate. So you can have resources available, but they're not the ones that you need. So I, I would really like to see us focus on both the adequacy and the availability of resources, that your organization is, is designed in a way that you can anticipate, adapt, and manage change. And then all of your systems that manage risk, and this includes systems like your asset management system. So don't forget about all the different systems that you have in your organization that they're all being coordinated and aligned. And then finally, those enabling behaviors, these sets of behaviors are kind of the how you get all of these things done. And so um, these are a topic all amongst themselves, but this is, these are really the core elements and, and how you get this work accomplished. So the question is, why do you need a resilience policy and strategy? Well, of course, your policy, you don't get anything done in your organization if there's not a policy because policy directs all activity. So you need to make sure you've got resilient objectives 
and those objectives need to be documented in your policy and they need to be embedded in those strategies that you develop. Really, these are the enablers for you to develop that strategic capability to anticipate and respond to change and as well as enable your organization to deliver its objectives and to not just survive, but also to prosper, which is pretty much the definition of organizational resilience that we've kind of thrown in there. Like any other policy, um, your policy on resilience should reflect the nature of your operating environment. So if you're writing your organizational policy tied to the individuals in your organization, or your policy addresses all of those contexts, and you have different strategic objectives for each one of those, however you decide to organize this, it needs to reflect your organization and everybody that's involved in your organization and specifically in managing the strategy needs to have a clear understanding of what the organization is trying to do as part of this activity. Of course, your context is going to influence the nature and scope of these policy objectives. Like I said, you might start big or you might start small. You might just test this out in one part of your organization. So your context of your resilience policy could actually be a subset of any of those contexts that we started about, what we talked about. You could start it with one of your largest uh, business processors or one of your products that is a large part of your business. You really, you can look at this in a lot of different ways, but it all needs to be documented in your policy. And included in that should be, what is our desired state? What are we trying to accomplish? What's our end game? Where are we trying to go on this journey? And how are we, you know, what methods are we going to use to get to travel on that journey? Of course, those objectives need to be prioritized in some way. The final thing really is that everyone needs to understand that resilience is an outcome. It's a state of being. It's not a discipline or a function or a process. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked to speak about how to write your organizational resilience plan. And I've said, I, I will not speak on that, but I will talk about your organizational resilience strategy. And then they get looked at like, no, we need a plan. And that really comes out of this misunderstanding of what resilience is and really looking at it from that risk management lens and not just you know risk management lens, but maybe specific to, let's just rename business continuity to be organizational resilience. And we need organizational resilience, I mean, business continuity, we need a strategy, we need a plan for that, but it's, it's a piece of what we're doing with building our organizational resilience um, strategic plan and, and really that outcome or state of being that we're trying to address. Kind of tied back to what we talked about with your policy piece, we need to have that shared vision and clarity of purpose. So your policy should very clearly articulate how this policy relates to all your other strategic and operational objectives, and everybody should understand what's, what's meant by this policy, as well as what's your context. So you should be documenting very clearly the understanding of what are your internal and external environments, because all of these things inform decisions about your priorities for resilience. And thirdly, none of this is going to happen unless, you know, if, if you're seeing this as a change management initiative to manage change, maybe, I, I won't say that it can't be done, but we also know that people don't like change. Doesn't matter the fact that, we're, that that's the world we live in and that you have to do this, but we need to see it more as this is who we are. We are going to be a culture where we are going to make our organization as strong and healthy as we can and that we need everyone involved in that process. And that should be part of, um, that demonstration of culture should be part of that policy. So I wanna start with just giving me a few thoughts to who understand kind of the audience and, and who's here and where you are in this journey. And please don't feel concerned if your answer to this is, I don't know, because that is important for you to be able to um, share. And I'm only gonna give you like 10 seconds for this. Um, to So, you know, does your organization have a resilience policy? I'm not aware of it, I believe so, but maybe I haven't seen it. Or we do have policies that support resilience, but they're very specific to managing risk or the areas that manage risk. And we've begun the journey. Feel free to say we've begun the journey. 
I do see a hand up. Um, if you can um, post your question, I can't really leave off of this screen. If you could just post your question in the questions, um, that will help. And I'm gonna give you two more seconds to vote. Okay, so it looks like Almost half of you, I'm really excited by this. 42% of you said you've begun the journey. This is really, really exciting. And I do expect that most resilience policies are now tied to specific functions. That's that's where I thought I would see, um, you know, that's where I really saw, thought that we would see it. Um, and then I actually was expecting more than this to say they're not aware of it, but it's very possible because of the target audience we have for this webinar too, that you're people that are already involved in this in some way or another. Um, it, the question had to do with there isn't, no, that we don't have one. And so you're tr that is correct. So probably the, the not, no, I'm not, that I'm not that I'm aware of would be that no. So sorry if that wasn't um, clear in the questions. You're gonna get something similar for the next poll. So just use that same option for the next one if there isn't one at all. So when I move to kind of the governance and accountability of this, like anything else, you're going to need a leader and somebody is going to need, be, need to be given the responsibility for this. It could be someone who's part of the executive team or it could be someone on the lead, you know, senior or top management team who's assigned this. I don't see this as a role for middle management. I really see this as not just me, but this is a role for somebody who's leading the organization because I know that the most frustrating thing that can happen to you is that you're given responsibility to do something, but you don't actually have the, I don't, I don't wanna say the ability to do it, but you don't have the, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. It's not accountability, but it's, you're not in a position in the organization to get people to do what you say. And, and that's not, I'm not saying that very clearly, so I apologize for this, but somebody needs to be a leader and that leader should have a team. That's the word I was looking for was authority. I should have just kept reading, but that the people that are given responsibility also need to be accountable because if you're not accountable, it's gonna be put to the back burner and they have to have the authority to be able to get this work done. And so as part of that, I often think of this as like a steering committee, um, like you might see for other initiatives, but the fact is that it needs to those people that are responsible for this should represent each of the organization's functions or lines of business or locations. However it is that your organization is organized, everyone should be represented because everybody should know what's going on. Even if they don't have any specific thing to do with it, they should be aware that this is happening. They should also be empowered because that shared vision and clarity of purpose is only achieved through collaboration so you need to have all parts of your organization working together. I know this sounds kind of like a pie in the sky thing, but it does work. And um, it's just that sometimes we get so mired down in the day-to-day -day things that, that the whole, the strategic vision of why we're there and what it is that we're trying to do gets lost. So in this um, McKinsey paper of building a resilient tomorrow, I would take a look at this. It's pretty interesting. It actually is focused more on public-private partnerships and more focused on um, kind of like the governance or what we might in the United States called, call um, the public entities that are providing the infrastructure where we need it. But everything that they've said in here is also very relevant to an organization. And I often say that in or, you know, a private sector organization and, a, and public sector organizations we, we just have different things that we're trying to accomplish, but we all need to work together. And how, we, and how resilience um, strategies and strategic objectives get implemented is the same. We're just different types of entities. So what they have put together are kind of what they're calling three essential pillars that serve as guiding principles for, for senior leaders to use in building resilience in their organization. So here is where I was talking about your context could be starting with your leadership people, that you need to build that resilience muscle with your leadership team and make sure that you have the organizational capabilities in place to go to, uh, to move to other parts of the area. And so here is where they talk about needing that resilience leadership mindset 
where you're going to create both defensive or preventative um, strategies as well as offensive and predictive strategies that are going to help increase your flexibility and adaptability to disruptions and changes. By the way, this paper is very much focused on disruptions, and I'd like us to think more broadly than that. But the disruption can be caused from just about anything. But they do use the word managing change in here, which I was ha happy about. So like we said, you need to appoint a person or persons responsible. And this person that's assigned needs to be senior, and they need to have a comprehensive view of the organization itself, as well as the resilience efforts that are being tried to put in place. This is really focusing on this idea of getting out of the silo, getting out of your space, and, and having that top really top-down approach or vision, being able to see how all parts are working together. And then you need to have an agenda. We need to move away from those isolated approaches with those unconnected initiatives. I'm sure many of you are part of those functional areas that are doing your very, very best to increase the resilience of the organization in the area that you work. Whether you're in risk management or business continuity or crisis management or emergency management, whatever area of the organization you are, you're all trying to increase the resilience of your organization. But we need to make sure that the, all of those initiatives are working together and that we're addressing longer term risks and opportunities. The second part of the pillar, which is going to be our fourth part of the thing we talk about today, is understanding, measuring, monitoring your organization along its entire resilience journey. And I really like the fact that they were using the word resilience journey as well. I feel like maybe maybe somebody heard what we were talking about, but this is, um, you know, you can't, and it, I'm gonna mention this later, but it needs to be iterative. We can't just be doing a, a project, with the beginning and an end that we report of our, our results. We need to be doing this in an iterative manner. And so, you know, you might want to start by assessing your organization against a resilience framework and help you to understand where you are now and where you want to be, and then identify your gaps to, de to help you determine what do you want that context to be. And so, th obviously, this is an area that i would recommend since we do have a resilience framework or a capability assessment tool for that. But there are other ones out there, and they were actually referencing one that communities might use. And then you need to develop your methodologies. So how are we going to factor resilience into all of our decision making? And to do this, we need to move from that point in time decision making model to more of a probability weighted and scenario based thinking so that we can understand the value of our different initiatives or our different ways that we are increasing resilience under a lot of different narratives and that making sure that they're somewhat plausible as well. And then action five within this pillar is to continuously measure and communicate your resilient sta status to your stakeholders. And this is where you need to have data. And this is why I'm saying it needs to be iterative. You can't continually measure and communicate if what you're doing is not iterative. And so, you know, what is our current state? How have we changed over time? Can we provide some clarity on the investments that we're making? and what are returns that we're expecting to see, but understanding we need to have that long-term approach. And so it's kind of a catch-22 sometimes is, is doing this iterative way of measurement and reporting and maybe not seeing significant changes right away. And so this is why having that understanding that this is a long-term approach, but we still need to be moving in a forward manner, even if it's not, for example, making us more money today or it hasn't saved us from some sort of crisis that we have experienced during this process. And this is where the, um, this paper specifically is looking at partnerships, but I just kind of removed the public-private piece of this, but understanding that can be done and should be done. But the fact is that there are challenges that every organization sees that you can't solve by yourself. And so looking at how can we develop partnerships, and this is where if you're in the business continuity space or, and or in the supply chain management space, that partnerships becomes um, something that you've maybe already identified that can be helpful to the rest of your organization to see how can we try to tackle this. Or if you're, part, if you're involved in the resilience of your community, um, how are you contributing to the resilience of your community and what can you do 
um, to also leverage other people who are involved in resilience of your community to work together in a way that doesn't impact your competitive nature of what it is that you're selling. So one of the ways that they suggest is to take a new look at how you do your financing, how you look at your insurance, and try to de-risk, is the term used here, your resilience. So they're saying, you know, there might be things that we're doing that are actually putting us at risk. So let's look at the financial side of this and the financial instruments that we're using to see if there's a way we can leverage that. And then, and then finally, like I mentioned earlier, look at partnerships, including that public-private partnership to enable collaboration. This idea of public-private partnerships is not new. Um, I used to be part of an organization that started years and years and years ago that was trying to work on this. And it was a challenge to do because it was often initiative by the private sector and sometimes the public sector wasn't very collaborative. And so, you know, when we can't close gaps on our own, where who can we go to collaboratively that can help with that where we both organizations can have a win. The last part of this that I think really looking at when you're looking at those gaps and and where it is you're trying to go on your journey is looking at it from these three aspects um, which is you know how resilient do we want to be so how does you know where does our organization desire to be and then how feasible is it you know how resilient can we be depending on the size of your organization um, how complex it is, you know, if you're a small business, you know, you might be able to be more resilient than some more complex businesses just because you're able to be more agile and adaptive. You're not so, you're not a bureaucracy. However, you also might not have the financial means to be able to be as resilient as you'd like to be, to put in redundancies for things, or you just don't have enough people because you are a small business to be able to do everything that you want to do. And then thirdly, that viability piece. How resilient are you required to be in? And depending on what business sector you're in, that's going to impact, um, you know, if you're in the financial industry, you're going to have um, a lot of requirements. Or, you know, in, even in technology, privacy issues and all those, you're expected. You know, So for example, in your organization, your technology systems might be required to be very resilient but you wanna also be looking at other systems. And so you can look at these three aspects from your entire organization as an industry, as well as the different parts of your organization. That will also help you to focus on your resilience efforts. So when you're looking at the desirability aspect of this, what do your stakeholders expect? Um, you know, Are the changes that you're trying to make gonna resolve some of the problems that you have? Um, and then looking at it, if we knew, if we knew today that we're going to have a pandemic in three months and all the things that were going to happen, what would you do during those during that time frame if you knew what was going to happen ahead of time? And so this is where we get to that planning piece is to look at these are the things that could happen. We need to plan for those. And maybe this will help to sell some of what you're trying to do for those of you that are managing risk in different areas. And then looking at the feasibility, really looking at how practical is this? You know, we really want to do this, but we we just, it isn't feasible for us to try to implement this. So what can we do? Do we have the current know-how and skills and resources and te technology to actually do these things? And how realistic is it? Or is it something that we can take a small piece of right now and build a plan that maybe you take the, the automobile route for this and you talk about, we're gonna take a little chunk now, and as we have more resources and more know-how, we'll take a little chunk later and we're gonna build it slowly versus you know, jumping on that plane and, and moving quickly from one place to another. And then really looking at your investment from um, your requirement and making also making sure, you know, can you afford not to make those changes? And that's sometimes looking at what, what could be the potential impact if we don't? And um, if you fail to invest, what is going to be your exposure? So looking at your risk appetite for things. And uh, again, this is something that should be iterative. It shouldn't be a one and done piece. It should be something that as you look at different strategic objectives, where do we wanna focus next? Or how, what do we wanna be doing congruently at the same time? 
Another interesting piece, and I wanted to throw this up here because I'm always fighting against that this is all about managing risk and risks of an event or an incident or a natural disaster, which are very important for us to plan for. But this is not all that we're talking about with resilience. And so um, another study that McKinsey did in early 2023 was um, what trends do you think are going to have your, the biggest impact on your organization? And what, do you, what are you going to be planning for to, to kind of mitigate those impacts? And here they talked about the risk of disruptive digital technologies. Well, also, obviously, cybersecurity, information security, this whole, um, a, all the AI things that are happening. You know, we don't even know if something, someone's voice is real or not. We don't really know if, it, what we're seeing is real? Is it, you know, just understanding that piece of it, as well as, you know, depending on where you are in the world, the, the pandemic and the post-pandemic times has really created um, difficult inflation, as well as challenging economies. And then their third concern was um, geopolitical risks, um, certainly that impacts supply chain and product availability, but also, you know, depending on where you are, you might be in a place where you're having a war and or that you're, there's a concern that you're having a war or that you can't get your supplies that you need because, um, you know, the supply chain is moving through areas that are very dangerous. And so these were their top three concerns. So we need to develop and design that strategic plan for resilience. When we're looking at that, we need to have our leadership involved. We've talked, we talked about that. We also need to make sure that your leaders really understand the importance of sharing information and knowledge and that the systems that you implement um, make sure that people have access to that knowledge and information when they need it. And of course, we talked about needing that this should be an iterative continual improvement activity and that people should be assigned to do that. And you should have performance management criteria that are not just documented, but are responsive to change as well. You should have cross-functional collaboration. So you need to collaborate with all the people involved, including you know, employees at all levels of the organization, regardless of their position and role as well as um, any external stakeholders that you might want to collaborate with. But the main thing here is this alignment. We're not building a separate program that's not connected to everything else. We want everything to be aligned with your organizational goals. That's why you're here. You're trying to make your organization more resilient so that it can um, meet its purpose. And so, under, also understanding that the more, just like any other change initiative, the more people are engaged, the more support you have. And understanding that your strategy, again, needs to be flexible. We're talking about trying to be more flexible as an organization as part of being more resilient. And so you need to make sure that your strategy is also flexible and that you can respond to changes that, that are coming through. So there should, when the leadership in charge of this plan should establish those focus areas, I was using the word context, but those focus areas, making sure that you then have action plans or strategic objectives and plans tied to those. What are the performance indicators? What are we trying to achieve along the way? And then making sure you've got the right resources that you need and that every, again, you're, you're communicating. Communication for everything is key. We've talked about having those objectives. They should be clear. There should be measurable steps. Um, and then they should be redone if you find they're not working or if you've identified a way that you can do them better. Also, any risks that might be part of that. You know, any project management process that you use, you should be identifying risks as well. And then put those objectives in some kind of an order um, so that you know what are your priorities, how are we going to do it, what are the things that we've got coming up next, and um, having that idea of priority orders also in case something happens that you need to change the priority of what you've been planning for. To do all this, you need to be situationally aware. We've talked about being not just um, responding and recovering, but the fact that we need to we need to be prepared 
And part of that preparedness is being aware of what's going on. You can't manage change if you're not looking out ahead to see what's on the horizon. People use all different words, horizon scanning, you know, situational awareness, whatever that is, um, doesn't really matter, but you need to be, as an organization, having everybody work in that mindset. You also need to make sure that you have technical competencies in place to do that. So I mentioned sometimes small organizations just don't have the people in place. So where you might wanna put initiative in place, um, you can't do so at this time. And making sure that whatever that you're doing, that that strategic plan is happening both horizontally and vertically in your organization and considers your existing strategies, any legislation or government, you know, um, compliance issues you might have, and anything that might be even external that might help you to leverage that. So kind of the, the similar question, I'm assuming that we're going to see some of the same data, but it's possible that you have a policy and you haven't started working on it yet. Um, so if, you're, if you don't have one, just say, not that I'm aware of. And again, I'm going to give you about 15 or 20 seconds for this. And we kind of collect this data and we, we use it over time to compare um, from, from year to year and, from, and to see um, how we're seeing an increased awareness in this. I'm going to go ahead and close it. And in this case, what we saw, we saw the a large number for the um, implementation or the policy you know being broad in this case we're seeing that the resilient strategies themselves are more specific to managing risk um, and then secondarily that you know it's being implemented and they're working um, it's nice to see nine percent thinking i i think so so um go ahead and find out so that you so that you know that and 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 ask to you know be informed of it. This is where um, just asking the question sometimes can help you to learn more about what's going on. If people aren't communicating it, maybe in the manner that includes everyone. So this is a paper that was a study that was published um, by Cranfield um, School of Management um, that BSI, the British Standards Institute, um, supported. And it was published in 2017. It's a really interesting study. I've referenced the study several times um, over the past few years, but even though it is seven years old, um, I think the study is as relevant today as it was then. There's so many things that we saw pre-pandemic that have become less relevant. This one, I think, has remained even more relevant than before, which tells you the quality of the study itself. And so here is where we need to under, that's, this is why the position for managing this resilient strategy needs to be senior because leaders have to make strategic choices and adjust those to fit contextual conditions. But sometimes they really struggle with balancing what they might see as competing priorities. So things like we have to be, we have to be compliant with these very prescriptive rules and regulations and standards. We have to protect our people, our reputation, our assets and the environment. These are rules we have to follow. We also were trying to respond to issues as they emerge. And we're trying to do this in a flexible manner and, some, and to give them um, opportunities to solve problems and to formulate creative solutions while sometimes being in this very compliant prescriptive environment. You also have investors and they want you to meet productivity and efficiency goals. And they want you to be able to meet all of these demands that are happening for your, for your products and services. And of course, you need, to, you need to be innovative in order to keep pace with all, of, all the change, all the new technology and everything that's happening, as well as consumer trends. And so you've got all these things and sometimes how are we going to do all of this and make sure our resilient strategy meets all of those requirements. And so they put together this model, which maybe you've seen before, but it, this in itself isn't so different than what you've also seen. So this idea that you've got progressive versus defensive, you've got being consistent being flex, and versus being flexible. So really those core drivers are, you know, are we progressive where are we progressive in our organization and where are we defensive? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna advocate that 
your organization is all four of these things, but depending on what part of the organization is, you might be more progressive than defensive, or you might be more consistent than you are um, flexible. So this idea that, that you can be many of these things, that you can be very consistent in your design, but also defensive, so the kind of preventative control side of things. You can also be having a kind of a mindful action where we're trying to be flexible, but we're also, and, and defensive, but we're also looking forward. Looking at performance optimization. So we're trying to improve what we're doing and explore what we're doing by being consistent. And we're also trying to be flexible and adaptive um, and innovative. The key here is that these are not either or choices. We're all of those things. And the organization itself is all of those things. So you need to kind of try to see how we can leverage those tensions by employing a both and and thinking versus the either or choice. And in this case, resilience is, really can be seen as a positive attribute to help you recognize some of those things. They go on to look at, okay, so you're focusing on performance optimization. How can that get compromised? or you're focusing on being very ad adaptive and innovative, and all of a sudden you see that that's decreasing. So understanding that none of this is permanent, everything's moving all the time, and that we have to be able to adapt to change, as well as, of course, sudden interruptions. So what can really impact um, the tensions for performance optimization? Well, when you experience a long period of success, Sometimes your leadership team is like, we can't fail. We're too big for that. Look at how great we're doing. And so having that singular focus on productivity can also be really detrimental to kind of those long-term sustainable performance, which resilience is. As we talked about at the beginning, it's going to take, it's, it's a long-term piece, not a short-term piece. And so if you're looking at performance optimization, that can really degrade your, your ability to do that. When we're looking at being adaptive and innovative, this can really be degraded when you're in a crisis mode. And this was really degraded during the pandemic. We were very adaptive initially, but long-term, we were trying to just manage all the change that was happening and being somewhat narrow and just getting done what we needed to get done. And so we, we weren't, a lot of organizations really struggled with keeping that adaptive and innovative side going while they were just trying to survive. We also see sometimes when um, our preventative controls get degraded. I kind of liked this picture in my mind about Swiss cheese, this idea that, oh, you see a little gap here and a little gap there, and they don't seem like a big deal, but then all of a sudden those kind of holes line up and all of a sudden we've got a huge gap. And this is something that happens a lot of times when your maintenance is defective and you're not keeping up all your maintenance of your systems where people stop being trained, or all of a sudden um, our written procedures aren't being kept up and all of a sudden people are just doing things that are outside of your, your standard operating procedures, and all of a sudden that's normalized and you find yourself actually creating your own crisis. And then lastly, when you stop investing in your people, your people become inattentive and they become mindless and they start losing situational awareness. and um, they're, they're really not empowered to make decisions and, and it kind of breaks down on that aspect. I am looking at the time and I realize I probably, I've been working very hard at not overdoing um, the slides, but today I was not successful. So just looking at how can we manage tensions between this, where you're trying to look at optimization and controls, you're trying to look at being innovative and being taking mindful action, you're trying to also you know, look at optimization as well as innovation, looking at how can you control things and looking at those mindful actions and noticing and responding, and then looking at the diagonals as well. How can we optimize and be mindful? And how can we be controlled as well as innovative? So it's kind of like the being, being the flexible and um, following the course at the same time. So just quickly for our last poll is, I want you to pick one because I don't want you to pick all of them and say we do all of these things, although I'm sure your organization does each of these things. But if you were to look at what's your primary focus 
that you see from your, your organization's leadership, which one of these would you choose? I'm gonna make an assumption that since a lot of you are in the risk management area that preventive controls might be top of mind for what you do, but I'm also looking at you for you to look at from a, from a top of mind, top management level, what, they're, what you see as what drives their purpose for their making their strategic choices. All right, I'm gonna do two seconds and close this. And that's interesting. The, the performance optimization, so your organization is working on making sure that what you have out there is working, um, kind of, and then your preventative controls, which I really thought would be the top one, no matter what, just given our audience. But I was also, I'm also encouraged to see the higher scores here with adaptive innovation and mindful action. I wasn't expecting to see that. I was really expecting most of you to be either be at, for the top performance optimization or preventative controls. So good for you guys, that's exciting. I do know that this whole looking at looking at what's ahead. Um, I just went to a presentation this week on on innovation with food and how um, from the kind of the farm to the to the plate type of thing and and how all the changes that are happening there. And it, I never had considered half of those. And being mindful and being able to look forward is really gonna be the key for a lot of organizations in that industry to remain successful. All right, so when we get kind of to finishing up, we need to have some way to measure resilience. We need to have some criteria for doing that. And so this idea of continuous improvement, that we're looking at this based on our learnings, based on the change that we're seeing, and being able to do that means that you're being you're going to be able to foster innovation and you're not waiting for this report to come at the end of the day. So it should be something that you're doing continuously and being able to adapt your approach when you see changes happening. Why should you do this? Well, and top management needs to understand your strengths and weaknesses. Um, they need to be able to understand this to make resilience a strategic initiative. Just being able to have an understanding of kind of where are you with these different capabilities helps you to make decisions on where that is. It also gives management or leadership um, the commitment to that sustained focus versus those short-term wins, getting, helping you to, to set those strategic objectives where you see those gaps and also just enhances their ability to implement specific activities because they have some ideas on where they wanna go. This, your assessment process should be about information gathering and evidence producing. So when you look at comparing where are you with different capabilities that are seen by more resilient organizations, you have a way to measure where you are against that. Um, so where, you know, what capabilities are potentially lacking what behaviors can we leverage to improve? So where do we see our strengths and how can we use those to help us um, with some of our weaknesses? Making sure that we've got those priorities again that we talked about to help you increase your agility and adaptive capacity. Looking at your strengths. So how can we leverage our strengths? And this is something I'd like to see when you have um, a, a more complex organizations as well, where you can say, you know what, this part of our organization is doing this really, really well. Can we leverage that knowledge and learning for other parts of our organization? And of course, looking at continuous monitoring and making sure that we're sharing that information with everyone to increase their awareness and, and the importance of this effort. Also looking at how can we implement in, uh, some controls here um, in that same study by Cranfield, they talk about essential outcomes. Those are the terms that, you're, that they're using. But what kind of safeguards can we put in place? Um, what kinds of code of conduct can we do to help control some of our things that so that we can um, make sure that we're not undermining ourselves and looking at our whole audit practice? How, how agile is that? How, what kind of data is that giving us? Try to make sure that we're increasing our flexibility to how we respond. And so looking at things like redundancy and diversity and, and really looking at flexibility by design, whether it's a product or service, 
and, and getting people to work effectively in teams and, and making sure that your communication systems are well done. Looking at, you know, even what are our different roles and responsibilities for recovering when we have something that breaks? How can we reduce our cost for managing that? And then looking at this whole innovation side is we need to create safe spaces for people to actually have time to experiment. And we need to be, make sure that we're encouraging informal networking. Um, this was before the pandemic. We need to do this even more now. And we've lost a lot of those things more recently. And so just looking at how can we do that. And I, I kind of, I like, we've been using the gears as, you know, a lot of our pictures for this. But we, I just wanted to kind of summarize this by everyone should be involved and it should be iterative and agile as how we do that. <coughs> Excuse me again, I ha I'm getting a cold. Just wanted to remind you that we do have our organizational resilience capability assessment. We are in the process of updating. We just updated the actual um, assessment tool and we're updating now the online assessment tool piece of that. We've simplified it a bit, but we've also added some things with our behaviors so that we have concrete ways to now measure those behaviors. And I'm really, really excited about that. So for each of these five dimensions, we have three um, what strategies or, or strategic objectives for that. And then tied to that, each one of those has five capabilities that you can measure. And then those six behaviors are tied to each one of those capabilities. And so we've we've created something that I think is a great version two and is leveraging all the things that we've learned since 2018 and 19 when we first developed this. We do recognize organizations that wish to be recognized and they submit their their report to us for that. And so let you know, let your resilience journey begin. Are you going to focus on your community and your external environment? Are you going to focus at your individual um, organization level more internally? Are you going to look at your teams, your leaders, or your individuals? Where are you going to start that journey? In this time, we do have a couple minutes for questions. I'm willing to take questions. Um, I will, I'm going to continue the slides and then just so we're not sitting here on this slide, but um, I will take questions as they come in or feel free to reach out and um, offer those up if you just, if you don't want to share them with the entire group. I would suggest that you take a look at these references. They're all publicly available, and we will include these references um, with your certificate so that you have those that you can take a look at. Um, we do have our education program and certification program on how to lead these initiatives and to build these strategies. And we invite you to attend. It's actually in, in two short weeks, even though February is longer. Um, we were tied up at conferences and things the rest of March, so we are on March 17th looking at how to be a better leader and how to lead this initiative. Um, looks like most of the questions were just thanks for the um, presentation. So on that note, thank you for attending. We appreciate it. Please feel free to reach out and contact us to learn more. And have a great rest of your week.